Welcome to the Dallas Cowboys Studio. Welcome to DifferenceMakerBibleStudy.org. I am your host, Difference Maker, real name Karsten Miller. We hope today that you will hear the Word of God. We hope that you will open your heart to receive the Word in humility, in honesty, and hopefully you will practice its truth. Today's presentation is sponsored by DifferenceMakerBibleStudy.org. You can catch us on the web at www.DifferenceMakerBibleStudy.org or www.Facebook.com slash DifferenceMakerBibleStudy. I am your host, Difference Maker, saying to you, welcome to today's presentation. God bless, my friend. Morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is Difference Maker here coming to you live from the Dallas Cowboy Studio slash office. Hoping you're enjoying this beautiful day in Maryland if you're in the Maryland area. Um, springtime going to be 60s and 70s. Springtime is here. We're on um, James chapter 1. Um, we're going to deal with uh, verses 5 through 8. This is the true test of sane religion, the faith that works. You know, I love a nice warm spring day, as I was just talking about, especially when I was a kid, when school would just be ready to let out. But it was interesting, the 15 minutes before classes would end, the doors would open outside and freedom would be on the horizon because the horrid day of school was about to be over. But the class nerd decides to ask the teacher a bunch of questions. At the pivotal point of the day, the geek figures it's the best time to rack the teacher's brain. Yet the teacher had no issues with sharing with the class such information. You know, I, I think the teacher would do this just to punish the class because they knew that we wanted to leave to enjoy that spring day. And the geek had a hard time getting to his home safely without a little healthy ridicule from his classmates. But I tell you something. That geek gained knowledge, knowledge to survive through the class because he or she gained wisdom into the material taught by the teacher. That's amazing. Oh, if we Christians could grab the same concept by seeking God for wisdom during our trials. But most of us may desire to see the trial end. Hurry up and get me out of this, Lord, is what we say. But what is God accomplishing, accomplishing through our trials? What is he really doing? In James the scattered Jewish believers may have been perplexed by the trials they were facing. One of them included harsh treatment from the rich seen in James chapter 2 verse 6. This trial presented a need to seek God for wisdom. James presented the dispersed an opportunity to see their trials in true light with joy and through wisdom from God to profit spiritually in their walk. And you can see um, Psalm 73 here is in mind. And God would desire that for us. From the counsel of Scripture, God implores His saints to seek Him for wisdom. Proverbs 3, verse 5 through 7 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. 
says in Proverbs 3 verse 18 through th verse 13 through 18 happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding for the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof fi than fine gold she is more precious than rubies and all the things that thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her length of days is in her right hand and in her left hand riches and honor her are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace she is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her and happy is every one that retaineth her Paul learned this himself because wisdom was given to him by God in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 15. But the question comes, why seek God for wisdom during trials? Well, wisdom has existed eternally with the Lord, seen in Proverbs 8, verse 22 through 30. It is centered around the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But by his doing you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that just as it is written let him who boasts boast in the Lord. It's 1 Corinthians 1 30 through 31. You can also look at Colossians 2 verse 2 through 3 and Luke 11 verse 49. It's centered around the Lord Jesus Christ who is the Lord of our lives and our Christian relationships. So we need His wisdom. Knowing God's wisdom is a spiritual matter and consists in the knowledge of His will, seen in Colossians 1, 9 and Ephesians 8 through 9. Wisdom is also desirous to be sought after. Proverbs 1, 20 says, Wisdom shouts in the street. She lifts her voice in the square. Proverbs 8, verse 1 through 3, Does not wisdom call and understanding lift up her voice on top of the heights besides the way where the paths meet? She takes her stand beside the gates at the opening to the city and at the entrance of the doors. She cries out. Wisdom is at a place where there are people crying out. To, to come and get godly wisdom. If men would just humble themselves and fear the Lord, they would gain the biblical wisdom that they need. She has sent out her maidens. She calls from the tops of the heights of the city. Wisdom calls and cries out to be heard. God Almighty desires to give his saints wisdom. Uh, the obvious response from the Christian should be not to turn his or her back on wisdom. But in the hardest of moments, we today turn our back to wisdom. May it be because we don't understand what wisdom really is. With such a loose use of wisdom today, it's good for the believer to know what biblical wisdom is. People say, you know, I'm seeking wisdom on doing this. I'm, I'm seeking wisdom on doing that. What are you really understanding about wisdom? Because you, you're still fearing. You're still scared. You're still having trouble in your trial. You're not counting it all joy. Well, wisdom is in the Greek text, saphias. And it means skill, wisdom cleverness, a right application of knowledge, wisdom regarded as residing in the mind. Wisdom is the ability to judge correctly and to follow the best course of action based on knowledge and understanding. Thayer makes an excellent point about wisdom when he says it's used of knowledge of very diverse matters so that shade of meaning in which the word is taken must be discovered from the context in every particular case. In other words, you got to understand the context um, in which to use wisdom. Wisdom is a word alone which covers a wide range of things. 
In James 3, wisdom is expanded upon as a morally upright walk. It is wisdom from God which leads not to strife and disorder but provides peace. This concludes that true godly wisdom manifests itself in practical moral results. How can we exhaust godly wisdom when it comes to our trials? How can we afford to rely on the counsel of the Lord in order to display a sane religion that works? Well, hopefully today we will grasp God's intelligence by examining two aspects of exhausting godly wisdom in our trials. The necessity of exhausting godly wisdom seen in verse 5 of James chapter 1 and the normal exhausting of godly wisdom seen in verses 6 through 8. Now let's look at the text here. And the text is James chapter 1 verses 5 through 8. And it reads, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. They give it to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. But let him ask in faith, not with nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind, and tossed. For let not the man, that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. This is a sane exhausting of wisdom in trials. Huh. This is a rich text and I think it to be one of the most beautiful, beautifully written texts in our Bibles. I only say that as to my experience that I am currently drawing from this well myself of rich wealth in the text. Instead of looping us in and out uh, of another flow of thought, James basically shows us there is something we can receive during the hardest of trials or the hardest of times, and that is godly wisdom. You know, Paul, Paul sought godly wisdom, and he said, Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Listen to this. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. Though Paul was without lack, he still needed to seek the Lord Jesus for this thorn. And God told him the wisdom, and that wisdom was, my grace is sufficient. Job was no different. He made some excellent statements about the supreme sovereignty of God, yet he desired an answer from God. Job said, though they slay me, yet will I trust him. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. David cried out to receive God's wisdom too, saying, Behold, thou desirest the truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Psalm 51, verse 6. And so James tells the dispersed, Although these trials should be esteemed joyfully to develop your spiritual faith, you best be calling on God for the wisdom to handle these trials. Are you calling on God in your trials? Is that the first one you go to when you're struggling? Or do you go to the big tent church? Or do you go to the pastor? Pastor, please pray for me. No, are you praying to God? Are you going to the Lord Jesus Christ? Verses 5 through 8 here, James is laying out God's offer to aid the believer during their trials. Why was it necessary for the dispersed to ask God for wisdom in their trials? Well, we see that, the necessity for exhausting godly wisdom. And it says, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Godly wisdom is necessary in this case to bear through our trials. You need the wisdom of God to get through 
your trial. You need Christ. See, if you're thinking that you're going to get there and get through it on your own, you're gonna, what's going to happen is what you're going to see in verse 13 of James chapter 1. You're going to blame God. And God says, don't blame me. That's why you should be seeking God for wisdom. To get through the hardest of times. Look, we are in a hard economic time in this nation. You're going to need the wisdom of God to get through it. Oh, do you trust him now when gas prices reach five dollars? Important concepts of the disperse are that is that the important concepts to disperse are to grab are the timing of the need to ask the one who needs to be asked. It's the time of necessity. A time there needs to be a clear time. For me to ask. Basically I'm saying. There needs to be a time for us. To ask God. That's what James is saying. Yes. James is seriously getting the believers. To recognize his ultimate need. For Christ. During every trial. Again. Christ has made this known. To his disciples in John 15.5. Without Jesus Christ. You can do absolutely nothing nothing he plainly captures the thought by saying but if any of you lacks wisdom have you known a time where you knew exactly what Jesus was doing in your trials the answer should be clear no you don't you don't know oh you may think you know but you don't know what's the next step in your life and how to get through the trial you gotta ask God but we Christians don't do that. We go and ask so and so. Like they know. Like they bought the trial. See if you go back to the concept. Back in, 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 in James chapter 1 verses uh, 2 through 4. You see that God counted all joy when what? Trials come. They're going to come. Your suffering is going to come. And God going to bring them. Now, if he's bringing them, why don't you ask the one who brought them? And don't ask with an attitude. James says that if we find ourselves in a trial and lack spiritual insight, our reflex should be to go to our Father and ask Him for wisdom, which is the practical application of His Word to everyday situations. We don't know, and we need to ask God. This makes the Lord available to give. Again, James is telling the readers that when your insight is non-existent in the trial, God's is available. The type of wisdom they need to ask revolves around the knowledge and awareness in preserving, persevering through the trial. It's necessary for them to have the proper knowledge and practice of the requ requisites for godly and upright living while facing their hardship. So give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil, for who is able to judge this great people of yours? 1 Kings 3 verse 9. Solomon seeking wisdom. Seeking his wisdom from God. Having wisdom will aid them in their trials. Listen to Proverbs 2 verse 10 through 12. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will guard you. Understanding will watch over you to deliver you from the way of evil. For the man who speaks from the man who speaks perverse things. Draw nigh to God for his wisdom. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hearts, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. James 4.8 
James knew the Christian lacks wisdom in the time of trial. He knows they will need to ask the one who is available. And so he points them in the direction of the one who will provide this wisdom. So he points them to the provider. And so we see that the provider is, uh, is when the provider is there, he's their necessity. So there's a provider when there's a necessity. And that provider is God. In Psalm 23, he is the soul's feeder of David and the shepherd of the sheep. James alludes that the only Jesus Christ has the provision for the wisdom needed to endure the trials. You can't go to anyone else. They can't help you out. No human wisdom will work. You got to go to God. The dispersed had to go to God. It's no different 2,000 years later. Go to Christ. Pray to Him. Ask Him for wisdom. God is the source of all wisdom. God has infinite, the infinite source of wisdom if we would just ask Him. Psalm 37, verse 4 through 5, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Love that verse. But commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will do it. When the trials of life get us down, look up. Look up to the heavens. Look up to the hills. Look to his word, which is filled with the wisdom meat we hunger for. Why in trials do we trust in ourselves? Why do we seek out man and not the Lord? We sometimes stop praying to Jesus and start asking men to pray for us. I'm going through a trial. I need help. Please help me. And we won't call on God. We won't call on Christ. We won't crack open the Bible. But you don't understand my pain. Yes, there is one who does open the scriptures and he'll talk to you. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 says all scripture is given. For what? Every life situation. Every trial that you go through, you got 66 books sitting here and you go in your house and got to blow off the dust on it because you won't call on Jesus Christ. We want to call on man. As I said before, pastor, please pray for me. Help me get through it. I don't know what to do. Did you open your Bible? But I'm in pain. Did you open your Bible? No, I didn't. Come here. Let me hug you. I'm with you. But go to Christ. Go to Christ. God is the one the dispersed were to look for when the wisdom tank was on E. Why? Because God has the correct wisdom but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. James 3.17 It's interesting to note that to a Jewish reader or teacher, speaking of wisdom was practical insight. They knew from the Old Testament that God had wisdom. Only the Lord giveth thee wisdom and understanding and give thee charge concerning Israel that thou mayest keep the law of the Lord thy God. First Chronicles 2 Chronicles 2.22 verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Psalm 90 verse 12. Know that God gives generously and without reproach to all that ask him that's the provision who gives to all generously and without reproach didantas didantas it means to give to present with the implied notion of giving freely unforced that's what god does that's how god gives his wisdom when you ask him for it this is a present active participle signifying the Lord continually gives graciously to his children. 
blank card says it is the characteristic of the unbeliever to see God with a clenched fist. It is a characteristic of the believer to see him with an open hand. Expositor's, Expositor's Bible Commentary says there is nothing in God that keeps him from giving. It goes on to say it is his practice to give generously and without finding fault. In other words, God, I ain't giving that to you. You asking me for wisdom? I ain't giving it to you. No, that's not God. That's not Jesus Christ. You come in faith and God gives generously. Haplas is the adverb that means liberally with singleness of heart. Here it describes God as the gracious and liberal giver. When we view the nature of God as a generous giver, we are encouraged we are encouraged the believer to come. We can encourage the believer to come boldly to him with our requests. So it causes us to ask the question, how giving is your God? He gives liberally. He's a liberal giver. And this is safe to say that it's the only a good time to call God a liberal. Because he gives liberally when you seek him for wisdom. And there's a promise that he attaches to this in the text. And it says it will be given to him. Kai dathesetai ato. This is the promise from the non-lying God. That God responds favorably when we seek him in our need. Matthew 7 verse 7 through 11. You should know this. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and ye, you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be open. Or what man is there among you who when his son asks for a loaf will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a steak. Will he, if you then being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask of him? And you quote that scripture all the time. Yet you won't go to God in your trials. James is trying to get us to see that. It is the only choice we really have is to go to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's look at the norm for exhausting godly wisdom. With all the liberal giving from God, then we should be liberally asking God, right? Uh, we see James has to intensify the normality of how this process during trials looks with God. He applies the barrier to block out any wasteful asking as we see in James 4, 3 where it says, You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Faith must be in place for one to ask in the proper way and for God to availably give to his children. But he must ask in faith without doubting for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind for that man ought not to expect he will receive anything from the Lord being a double minded man unstable in all his ways. Let me state this quickly. This doesn't support any type of word of faith garbage that you must speak it to God and he will dupe it. He will do it. That is nonsense. The key to proper hermeneutics and prosaic exegesis is context, context, context. And what is the current flow of thought and James James is stemming from? He is relating to them from their trials, not the wants and needs of their dying flesh asking God that only see if we we ask God for what we want it only leads the believer to blame God which I said James addresses in verse 13 and so on 
the dispersed are going through trials. They're not seeking God for money, cars, and clothes. Stop making God a candy machine that spits out what you want. You listen to these lying word of faith teachers, pimps like Creflo Dollar and, 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 and Price. And all these guys telling you, you got to ask in faith and you got to sow. And you listen to Jake's. And these guys are liars from the pit of hell. False teachers speak lies, telling so-called Christians that all they got to do is speak it into existence and it will happen. But they don't tell them that they got to go through anything. Yet you see here in James, he says, in your trials, which God is going to give to you, you ask him. And he'll give you the wisdom. You ask him in faith. There's an exclusive criterion. And that exclusive criterion is faith. Now, there are two important things to see here. Faith is to be without doubt. And faith is to be with stability. Now, if these two are not true, then what we see here, if they're not true, is we don't have faith at all. You know what the scripture says. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of these of things not seen. Hebrews 11.1 1. So faith must be without doubt. But he must ask in faith without doubting. Diakrina menas. Diakrina menas. And it means to separate throughout. Here in... Uh, um, or uh, middle to separate oneself entirely to be in separation with oneself to be in strife with oneself to hesitate to waver it literally means to judge between two and has a range of meanings in the New Testament the primary idea is that of differentiating by separating other meanings may include making a distinction between persons by evaluation, seen in Acts 15, 9, 1 Corinthians 4, 7, and Acts 11, 2. It means to make an evaluation, to judge, or to pass judgment, seen in 1 Corinthians 11, 31, and 1 Corinthians 11, and 14, verse 29. So in essence, it means to judge between the two. This is the reason this person is the one who is facilitating between two opinions or decisions. God saying that man is unstable in all his ways. He's not, he's not, he doesn't have a faith that has stability. He goes to and fro. Well, I, I, I want, I want to get out of the trial, but I want to mope in the trial. He, he don't know what to do. He's tossed to and fro. It's like the one who's tossed by every wind of doctrine. It's not secure and sound in their theology. You must have a faith in Jesus Christ without doubt. And that faith must be stable. It must have stability. Um, this is that man is somewhat of a derogatory reference to the doubter and um, whom James has just compared to the tossing wave. He is further characterized as being double-minded and unstable. Uh, Dysikos is the strictest literal sense and it means uh, double-souled. It is a it is as though one soul declares, I believe, and then an other turns it shouts, I don't. This sort of instability is not only apparent when the man prays, it marks all he does in his personal life, in his business life, his social life, as well as in his spiritual life. Indecisiveness negates his effectiveness. He's not stable. You see, his faith is not strong. 
One day he's strong in it, the next day he's doubting. Now this is getting kind of scary because you're like, that sounds like me. That's exactly why James says in every one of your trials, ask God for wisdom. So you see the stability of your faith. In response to this kind of faith, God will give wisdom to those who ask for it and will enable them to persevere in the times of trial. Let's look for a second at Mark 9, verses 25 through 27. We're going to see a stable faith. You must have a faith and ask God in the time of trial. And we must ask God in faith, a faith that doesn't doubt, and a faith that is stable. And that is only the Christian faith. When Jesus saw the crowd was rapidly gathering he rebuked the unclean spirit saying you deaf and mute spirit I command you come out of him and do not enter him again this is when the boy's father in the earlier verses it says immediately the boy's father cried out I do believe help my unbelief see he was he was stable he knew where he was doubting see that it wasn't that he was caught between two opinions. Sometimes people take that text and say, see, he didn't know what he, he had a little faith. No, he had faith, but he knew where he, he didn't believe. And that's okay to tell God, look, God, this is a hard trial. I need your wisdom. I'm doubting here. That's a faith that is stable. That's someone trying to balance. You see it? Stop going around asking God for cars, money, and houses. Start asking God for wisdom in your trials. Start seeking the Lord and not man. Sanely exhaust the Lord Jesus Christ for wisdom in your trials. This has been Difference Maker saying to you, God bless my beloved. Stay in tune, the Word of God. Thank you for coming out and listening to today's broadcast. I hope it has been a blessing to you. You are a blessing to us. And we thank you for listening to today's presentation. Remember to stay in the Word of God. I am your host, Difference Maker, real name Karsten Miller, coming to you live from the Dallas Cowboy Studio. God bless.